In Canada, we like to obsess over how long a person served as Prime Minister and we tend to ignore the amount of things they did before and after they were Prime Minister. Case in point is John Turner, who served for 79 days in 1984 between Pierre Elliott Trudeau and Brian Mulroney. He's mostly remembered for losing the 1984 election, and when he died, it was really sad because people only identified him as the guy who served 79 days. When in fact, he had a large impact on Canadian history, was a very gifted parliamentarian, and in all honesty, before he was ever in Parliament, had a life I would envy. He was known to dance with Princess Margaret, he was an Olympian, or at least nearly an Olympian. He had a fascinating life, and that life was explored in John Turner, a new book by Steve Pakin. And I talked to Steve about John Turner, writing the book, and much more. I guess the first question is kind of an obvious one. What inspired you to write the book on John Turner? Uh, strange, but I didn't really want to. <laughs> I had just finished 550, 600 pages on former Ontario Premier Bill Davis, and that one really took a lot out of me. And I kind of resolved to myself that I wasn't going to write any more books, at least not for a very long time. And, and then John Turner died in September of 2020. And a couple of his colleagues approached me after Mr. Turner died and said, you knew him, you covered him. Uh, you were at the liberal leadership in 1984 that he won. Uh, our birthdays are two days apart. So he and I used to go out for a birthday lunch uh, once a year. And, you know, I'd get together with them on various occasions outside of that. And they said, they said, you can write a different biography on John Turner that has been written already because of your knowledge of the man, your friendship with him, um, you know, no sugarcoating the record, but mm -hmm. you can bring something different. And I guess the more I thought about it, the more I thought, you know, maybe they're right. So <laughs> thus the book. And then you mentioned that you knew John Turner. How would you describe him for somebody who obviously only knows him through, uh, you know, him being prime minister and news and things like that? Well, it depends which John Turner you're talking about. When he first got elected in 1962, I would describe him as Canada's John F. Kennedy. Mm -hmm. He was this young, I guess he was, what, 32 years old, 33, something like that, 33 when he first got elected. He was this young, handsome, dazzling, you know, the kind of choice of the next generation kind of politician uh, who people looked at and said, that guy's going to go all the way someday. Uh, you know, they just, he, Kennedy became president in 61. Turner got elected for the first time in 62. And th the comparisons were inevitable. And then he started to make his way up the political food chain. And he became a high, I guess he was the most successful. If the current prime minister's father was the most successful politician in the whole country, based in French Canada, John Turner was the most successful politician in the country based in English Canada. Uh, he was the premier Anglophone political leader in the whole country and was right up until he became justice minister and then finance minister. And then he had a big falling out with Trudeau and resigned in 1975. Went to the private sector, became a big rainmaker on Bay Street. So that's, a, again, a different kind of guy. He's, he's a much desired corporate director at this point. He's no longer the, you know, the fair haired knight in waiting, uh, <laughs> until Trudeau loses the 79 election. And then all sorts of people want John Turner to come out of the woodwork and run and get back into public life. And he declines. Uh, but then Trudeau did it for real in 1984, left for good. And Mr. Turner at that point, rusty though he was having been in the private sector for a decade, uh, he could not withstand the entreaties by his fellow liberals, his fellow Canadians, to get back in the race, come back in, try to save the Liberal Party, try to realize his destiny of becoming prime minister. And it all ended after 79 days. Mm -hmm. So th th that's, that's kind of a second or maybe even third now I, where I'm losing count here. <laughs> that might be a third John Turner. And then by the end, you know, by the end, he's a guy in his 70s, 80s and 90s who's giving speeches, trying to turn people on to democracy and trying to tell them that democracy doesn't happen by accident. You've got to participate. And that's the final John Turner, the guy who's out there stumping for democracy and warning people not to lose it. So it's a, it's, it, it might be a simple question. It's a hard question mm -hmm. to answer because there's so many different John Turners along the way. 
Absolutely. Um, one thing I noticed in your book was you went through his uh, childhood and his young adult life very quickly. Uh, just It was a very small section of the book. Was that kind of a conscious decision or was there just not a lot of information about that, that period of his life? Uh, it's funny, I guess a little bit of both. You know, he was born in England. Um, if, he, if, he, if he wanted to be pre- president of the United States, he never could have been because you got to be born in the States to be <laughs> an American president. But of course, Anybody can be born anywhere and become prime minister of Canada. I kind of like that about our country. <laughs> and, and as a result, he, and he lost his father to a botched operation when he was only two years old. Mm-hmm. So he knows n- nothing about his father. He doesn't know where his father's buried. There's a lot about his background that is not known. And his mm-hmm. wife, Jill Turner, who's 80, almost 85 now, I think her birthday's next week. Uh, she's been trying to fill in a lot of the gaps over the years because Mr. Turner knew very, very little about his background. And, you know, his mother, his mother having lost a husband and then an, a child shortly thereafter, John Turner had a sibling that died just a few days after being born um, or might even have been a few hours. I can't remember now. I think it might've been a few hours. There's so much about this that he did not ask his mother because it was just all so tragic so he and his one remaining sibling, Brenda, who's 91 years old, lives in Montreal, the two of them know very little about that part of family history. So, you know, yes, because there's so little available and also, yes, very little in the book because uh, he didn't talk about it. Lots of people mm-hmm. tried to engage him on, on the issue of his, his parents and his, he talk about his mother. His mother became quite a famous civil servant, the highest ranking female civil servant in all of Canada at the time. Uh, but his dad, he knew precious little about. A mm. um, couple of my questions kind of deal with hypotheticals. Uh, the first one is, um, obviously, if Trudeau didn't run in 1968 for whatever reason, what kind of chance would have Turner had being that young, dynamic leader, uh, you know, like you said, uh, Candace John F. Kennedy? Well, the glib answer is to say a lot better chance, but the more in-depth answer is I'm still not sure he makes it all the way. And the reason is, you know, he's still only in his high thirties when he runs Mm -hmm. for liberal party leader in 1984. And there were, I mean, that was the knock on him, Craig. The knock on him was he's just too young, not this time, but next time, which is why he came up in his speech with that incredible (laughs) prescient line where he said, I'm not running for some future convention in 1984. I'm running for right now. This is no time for mellow men, you know, and he, as he was trying to exhort the crowd. Mm-hmm. And, and yet, incredibly enough, <laughs> it was indeed in 1984 that he ended up running and winning again. Uh, so, I mean, you got to remember, he, he came third. Robert Winters, who was another liberal cabinet minister of the day, he came second and he almost beat Trudeau. Trudeau only won with like mm-hmm. 50 and a half percent of the vote. So it, it was really close. Uh, so if it wasn't Pierre Trudeau, it was probably have been Robert Winters. Um, and Turner was sort of a, a distant third at this point in his life. And then kind of the next question, a bit of a hypothetical, when would have been the perfect time? Uh, 1968, 1979, if for whatever reason, Joe Clark worked more with the minority government and the other parties and it's, you know, it didn't fall or, and he could take over as uh, the leader of the Liberal Party or 1984. Like, was there a good time where he could have come in and had a, a very good chance of, of winning an election? These are, are, are great, but very speculative questions. So it's hard <laughs> to know. But, but let's put it this way. When he came in in 1984, I'm, I'm very much of the belief that, that the people of Canada in 1984 didn't hate the Liberal Party. They hated Pierre Trudeau. Mm-hmm. They weren't that desperate to get rid of the Liberals, as evidenced by the fact that after they had that leadership convention in 84, uh, they, they zoomed right back up to first place in the polls. Uh, When Mr. Trudeau was prime minister, they had really sunk like a stone. People had just, you know, he'd been prime minister for 15 years. People had just had enough. And and when Mr. Trudeau stepped down and when Mr. Turner came in, the Liberal Party's chances were much buoyed. And his big mistake was doing what Pierre Trudeau did when he won in 68. And that was Mr. Trudeau called a snap election and won a majority government. And John Turner tried the same thing won the leadership, called a snap election, but this time it didn't work. And I have, well, I I was about to say, I have no doubt but that. I guess I should have a little doubt (laughs) because after all, we we don't know here. Mm -hmm. But but he led the liberals to what was at that point their worst showing ever. And I have to believe that had he not called that snap election, had he chaperoned 
Queen Elizabeth II around the country as was planned. Had he chaperoned, he was Catholic. Can you imagine when the Pope made oh, yeah. his visit in 1984 and John Turner being photographed with the Pope all over Canada? Uh, ha had he spent some time in the House of Commons? He never spent any time, not one minute, in the House of Commons as prime minister. He did in his first go around and he did as opposition leader, but the House wasn't sitting when he won the convention. So had he brought the House back, actually passed some legislation, actually done a question period, actually allowed the people to see him act as a prime minister of Canada. I have no doubt the results of that next election, whenever it would have been, and it should have been in 1985, not 1984 when he called it, he'd have done better. Would he have been mm -hmm. able to beat Brian Mulroney? Good question. Mulroney was awfully bloody good. Mm -hmm. So who knows? Um, that actually kind of leads into another question I had, which was about the Pope and the Queen. One thing I never understood was why he didn't use that amazing opportunity to have these two high profile people to get his his uh, image back out there because like you say in your book he'd been out of uh politics for i think nine years by that point so it was a good way to get back out there was that the the biggest error do you feel uh in in the, uh the snap election i guess could be called the biggest error but was the not being with the pope and queen elizabeth ii a, a major error that um, like you said might have turned the tide at least a little bit without question and and you know what uh, part of it was Part of it, you know, a lot of people told him, don't call a snap election. Go, don't go too quickly. Jean Chrétien, whom he defeated in that 1984 leadership convention, said, the public doesn't know you well enough yet. You know, you've been in the private sector for a decade. You've only just come back into public life for the last six months. You know, there's a lot of Canadians who don't remember you from a decade ago. You've got to reintroduce yourself to a lot of people. And he urged uh, Turner not to do it. Of course, that advice coming from his prime foe would have been seen as suspect and therefore uh, not taken. But yeah, I, I think undoubtedly the worst mistake he made in his political life was calling that snap election in 84. And, and the reason, two reasons. Number one, he saw the example from 68 with Trudeau and he thought, okay, well, you've seen this work before. Let's try this again. He said a very interesting comment to somebody once when he said, I can't serve on that guy's mandate. And by that, he meant, you know, remember, John Turner had a really deep, abiding love and passion for democracy. And he somehow felt that winning a convention where he would have been the choice of, you know, more than a significant, he won on the second ballot. So he, he won a big victory. But only being the choice of several thousand liberal delegates was not enough for him. He needed that good housekeeping seal of approval, that legitimization that only came from winning a general election. And so he said to somebody, and it's quoted in the book, I can't serve on that guy's, meaning Trudeau's, mandate. I need my own mandate. And so he very much wanted to get out there quickly. He hoped win an election and then be able to bring the House back as prime minister and serve on his own mandate. And, you know, clearly in hindsight, a mistake. Mm -hmm. There's no reason. There's nothing in Canadian law. There's nothing even in Canadian convention that says when you win the leadership of your party, you've got to go right away. I mean, you're, you're actually, believe it or not, you're actually entitled to take your time. Um, there was, I'm trying to remember, the election was in 1980. So John Turner could have waited until the winter of 1985 before going to the polls. Mm -hmm. But he insisted on going in uh, the, the late summer, September of 1984. And, um, Boy, you know, politics is cruel, Craig. You make a bad mistake, it does not, it does not forgive you. And, yeah. and it did not forgive him. Absolutely. Um, would things have been different if Joe Clark had have said that the support that he had in the 83 leadership election for the progressive conservatives was enough and Turner would have been going up against Joe Clark rather than Mulroney? Boy, another great question. I've never been asked that question before. That is a <laughs> that is a really terrific observation. And just for for your younger listeners who may not understand the chronology here. January 1983, there's a progressive conservative party convention in Winnipeg, at which time there's going to be a, a vote on whether Joe Clark should continue as leader. Uh, because, you know, parties are obliged to have these check-ins with their leader every few years. And 66.9% of Tory delegates to that convention said they wanted to keep Clark on, 66.9%. And Clark said that's not enough. So he resigned as leader, called a convention at which he would have needed 
50% plus one to win. So how that was enough, but 66.9% <laughs> wasn't enough. I'm still trying to get my head around. But the reality is that it wasn't enough. They went to a convention uh, in June of 83 and Brian Mulroney beat him on four ballots in the convention of June of 83. Your question, if Joe Clark had decided to say 66.9 is enough for me, I'm going to stick around and go up against John Turner, who would come along a year later and win his leadership in June of 84. A, a totally different contest, to be sure. You would, you would have had in that case, you would have had Joe Clark, who's sum total of his prime ministership at that point had only been nine months in 1979. He'd have been leader of the opposition. He would, he would not have been this sort of shiny new leader that Brian Mulroney was, right? Mulroney was, Mulroney was really very good. He was a great speaker. Um, he'd never been in politics before. He'd run for leader of the PC party and won in his second attempt. He lost to Clark in 76. He won the next time in 83. And again, you have, you have to think that given that Clark was not as good a leader as Mulroney was, I don't take any joy in saying that, but I think the record proves it. Mulroney won back-to-back -back majority governments, the only Tory since Sir John A. Macdonald to do it. Uh, you'd have to say Turner would have had a better shot at holding on to the prime ministership if Joe Clark had still been the leader. I think your premise makes some sense. Oh, absolutely. Um, when you look at the Liberal Party, kind of the ruling party for Canada for a majority of the 20th century, and in your book, you do mention how Laurier kind of uh, influences William I. Mackenzie King becoming prime minister, who does the same for Louis Saint Laurent, and then Lestrie Pearson, and Trudeau. What role did Trudeau not continuing that trend have? And like you mentioned in your book, he even just comes on stage and doesn't really like go up to Turner and metaphorically put his arm around him, I guess, and, and, and get everybody kind of on, on board. Never mind metaphorically. I mean, literally, that's what you're <laughs> supposed to do. Yeah. When you're the outgoing leader, you are literally supposed to grab the hand of the person who succeeds you, thrust it into the air, and convey the impression that this is a united party around its new leader. Mm -hmm. And Pierre Trudeau did not do that. And he didn't do that in part because he and John Turner had not spoken in a decade, right? John mm -hmm. Turner resigned from Pierre Trudeau's cabinet in 1975. They had a dispute. Turner was the finance minister. They had a dispute over wage and price controls, which Trudeau wanted to bring in and Turner did not. So he resigned. And as a result, the two of them did not speak, well, 1975 to 1984. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until Turner won the leadership uh, that the two of them had their first conversation. So there was no trust there. There was no friendship there. Um, and as a result, when that moment on stage happened, where you would like to see the old leader and the new leader come together to bring all the delegates in that room together, that never happened. And it really did. It, I, I was at that convention. It was so noticeable in its absence. Trudeau stepped forward, looked like he was going to say something, looked like you know everybody in the room was sort of waiting for him to lay hands on his successor. And he didn't. He didn't do anything. He stepped forward. He waved to the crowd. And then he stepped back. <laughs> and that was it. And, you know, I certainly know the group that I was watching the thing with were saying, well, boy, isn't that curious? I've never seen that before. <laughs> and it really got a, it, that got John Turner off to a very, very bad start. It was not helpful. Uh, I do like in your book how you point out that uh, his opponent, Brian Mulroney, seemed to show more love to, to Turner on winning the, uh, the leadership than, than Trudeau did with that note that he sent over to him. You know, these were the days, Craig, when um, there were rules. There were rules mm -hmm. about civility. They weren't written down. They're just, you know, if you're a classy person, you did it. And yes, you're absolutely right. The night that John Turner won his leadership convention, he opened a handwritten letter from Brian Mulroney congratulating him on winning the leadership, welcoming, welcoming him to the fray, conveying his best wishes to Mr. Turner's wife, Jill, and their four kids, and, you know, nothing at all in the note about, you know, and I look forward to beating your brains in whenever you want to have an election. Nothing. No, it was civilized. It was congratulations and good health to you and yours. And I'll tell you what, uh, we've lost that today. Uh, mm -hmm. There's no one day's grace anymore. It's, it's all it's piling on from day one nowadays. And it's just it's a shame because, uh, you know, that those little those little signs of civility were a good thing for public life in this country. And I regret the fact that we don't seem to have much of that anymore. Without a doubt. Uh, going back a little bit, 
how how was John Turner as finance and uh, uh, finance and uh, justice minister uh, through kind of a very tumultuous time in the 1970s for Canada? The short answer is significant. Uh, I mentioned earlier the fact that he was the most important a politician, English speaking, English language politician in the country, fluently bilingual, incidentally, his first writing he represented was in Montreal. But, um, but he was the, the, the most important uh, Anglophone cabinet minister in the country. And as a result, you won't be surprised to hear he had uh, the two senior most portfolios. First justice, during which time he legalized abortion, during which time he legalized homosexuality, which was a crime in this country before John Turner, a staunch Catholic, legalized it. Now, Pierre Trudeau got the attention for it by coming up with the great line, the state has no business in the bedrooms of the nation. But it was John Turner who got the bill through parliament. So let's get that on the record right away. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it's funny, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Yes, uh, when John Turner was finance minister, the Canadian dollar was actually worth more than the American dollar. It was worth a dollar seven. <laughs> I mean, when we sit around nowadays, for any of your people listening, uh, who like to go to the States for a vacation and realize that their, whatever it is, 77 cent dollar doesn't go very far in the United States. Uh, back in the day, you went to the States and your dollar went further than it went in Canada. Uh, so the dollar was high, but we had a lot of the same problems. You know, where Inflation was out of control. Deficits were getting to be problematic. Uh, unemployment was stubbornly high. So, uh, and, and John Turner conveyed the impression of a guy who was a steady hand on the tiller. And when he resigned in 1975, just to give you an indication, uh, it did send shockwaves through the country, but it also sent shockwaves through the Ontario election, which was happening at the same time as Mr. Turner, Turner resigned on the 10th of September, 75, and the election was eight days later. And the Liberals were poised to win that election over Bill Davis, who at this point was just a one-term premier. The Liberals were poised to win, and Turner's resignation shocked Liberals so much Believe it or not, it took a lot of wind out of the provincial liberal sales. And Davis came back in the remaining eight days of that campaign to hang on to a minority government. So it had significant implications across uh, the economy and across politics uh, in the whole country. But he was, a, he, he was considered a very, very creditable minister in both those portfolios. Now, I used to live in, in Rossland, British Columbia. Oh, yeah. Uh, for a time. Yeah, a beautiful place. One of the best places I've ever lived. But there is absolutely nothing there to say, even hometown of uh, John Turner. I mean, you drive across Canada and somebody who won a bronze medal in 1972 or whatever, there'll be a sign for them. But there's nothing for, for John Turner. And then when he passed away, a lot of the focus was on you know prime minister for 79 days. Do we focus too much on that? Because if you look at somebody like him or Joe Clark, who had a very strong career as foreign minister through the 80s, or Sir Charles Tupper, who had a very long career in the 1800s, do we focus too much on, oh, they were only prime minister for this amount of time, and that's it? We do, and that's a. Uh, I'm so glad you raised this because that's another reason why I wanted to write this book. Because when John Turner died in September of 2020, the Globe and Mail had a headline that said John Turner, comma Prime Minister for 79 days, comma dies, and so many of his friends and colleagues were upset with that headline because because it suggested that the most important thing about his life was the fact that. Save and except for Charles Tupper, he was the shortest serving prime minister in Canadian history. And as I hope we've talked about here already, there's so much more to him than that. His time as justice minister was significant. His time as finance minister was significant. The man, when he was the parliamentary secretary to the Northern Affairs Minister, uh, you know, took his family on canoe trips to northern parts of this country that no white family has ever seen. Before or maybe even since, he was, mm -hmm. certainly might have been the first, um, you know, white family to go. That it was all ind only indigenous people who'd been in the in those parts of the country, and he fell in love with the North in a way that nobody ever had before or maybe since. Um, his 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 going to Ukraine to oversee a 500 person strong delegation uh, for the Ukrainian presidential elections in 2004 told you everything you needed to know about his passionate commitment to democracy. If I'd have been writing the headline, I would have said, John Turner, comma, you know, former prime minister and champion of democracy for half a century, comma, mm -hmm. dies. That's what he did to try to turn young people onto democracy. A guy in his 70s, 80s, 
going into schools three, four times a month, continuing to give speeches about the importance of public life and engaging in politics. Uh, to me, that's his real legacy, not the fact that he happened to be prime minister for a handful of days. Absolutely. And then a lot of people forget that after the 1984 election, he did serve for the rest of the 1980s as the opposition leader and, you know, slowly helped to rebuild the party. They bounced back a bit in the 1988 election. Um, how would you describe him as an opposition leader? Well, his most important moment, of course, was in the lead up to that 1988 election when he made the decision after really, really thoroughly reading the free trade agreement, he might have been the only politician in that whole House of Commons who actually read the agreement cover to cover, posted notes all over it, underlines, you know, dog-eared pages. He really did go through it uh, with a very fine tooth comb and made the decision that the Liberal Party, that this was their, the fight of their life, that they were going to oppose what they believed. They weren't against free trade. They said they were against that particular agreement. Now, Honorable people can disagree about the advisability of that agreement and whether in the long run it has served Canada well or not. I think the preponderance of evidence is that it has served Canada well. So you could argue Mr. Turner was on the wrong side of history, but in his guts and his bones, he believed it was wrong for Canada. He fought it and, and, and he was never a more impressive opposition leader than he was in the lead up to that 88 election when he had a great moment in the leaders debate and when he made it the co-celeb of his life to oppose this thing. Uh, had the election happened uh, three weeks earlier than it did in 1988, he'd have won. Mm -hmm. He'd have become prime minister again. Uh, but uh, the time after the debate and between election day was uh, much longer than it is nowadays. And as a result, uh, lots of time for Brian Mulroney to stage a comeback, and he did. And yes, Mr. Turner doubled the liberal seats, but it was still a second majority government for Brian Mulroney, and that was the end of him. You don't get to lose a third time nowadays. Um, to and out, and that, yeah. and that was it for him. And then um, he rebounded with the 1988 uh, leaders debate and, and did well in that. What impact, it's kind of become kind of a legendary debate now, but what impact did the 1984 debate have on the election and the performance of Mulroney uh, versus Turner? Well, these, these uh, two elections, 84 and 88, are two of the most consequential elections in Canadian history, and in part because the two debates, and they're kind of bookends of one another, uh, they were two of the most consequential debates we've ever had. 1984, John Turner, having just made 26 what most people thought were truly gross patronage appointments on behalf of Pierre Trudeau, putting a lot of outgoing cabinet ministers and MPs uh, into uh, sinecures in the public se public service, uh, that did not sit well with the electorate. And when John Turner inexplicably raised the issue of patronage in that 84 leaders debate, Brian Mulroney just turned on him and said, <laughs> you had an option, sir. You could have said, no, this is not good for Canada. And the election was over game set and match that night. Mm -hmm. It was the, it was the most consequential change of public opinion in one leaders debate ever before. And certainly since. I mean, it was, uh, it all happened on that one night. And, and yet four years later, the tables were turned and it was mm -hmm. Turner going after Mulroney on free trade and, and just having such a good performance and raising enough doubt in the Canadian public's mind that oh, maybe this agreement is not so good for Canada and maybe we shouldn't be doing this and raised enough doubt to get the Liberal Party, which, which I think it was as low as 26% at one point, or maybe even 23, uh, in the lead up to that 88 election. And that great debate performance by Turner got them up into the low 40s for a short time until, as I say, Mulroney staged the big comeback and ended up winning the majority again. But those two debates are, are a great they should be studied together because they're mm -hmm. exactly the opposite of each other, right? Mulroney cleans up in the first, Turner cleans up in the second. They're both hugely consequential and, and fascinating to watch. Without a doubt. And then the, the last question is, with your book, what is the main goal? Is it, like you said, to kind of change that attitude of, of John Turner, comma, 79 days prime minister dies, to change that, that view of, of not only John Turner, but maybe encourage people to look at other prime ministers who short, served a very short time, but had longer careers than, than what the time in prime minister lets on? Yeah, I, I, I can't say that that latter uh, suggestion was in my head. I, I'm, I'm not sure about other prime ministers. Uh, 
I'm listening to your series, as you know, and and uh, I've learned a lot about some of those other short-serving prime ministers, particularly the ones uh, who succeeded Sir Johnny MacDonald. Mm-hmm. But it'll I'll leave it to others to to write books about them. But yeah, twofold. Number one, I, I I do think John Turner was entitled to a bit of a reinterpretation of his life. It was a lot more consequential than just 79 days as the prime minister of the country. There's a lot more going on. Uh, I've talked about his championing of democracy being the most significant mm-hmm. of those, I suspect. Um, but also, how old are you? I'm uh, 42. You're 42. Okay. So you have no firsthand memory of that 84 convention. You have no firsthand no, memory no. of him as prime minister. Right. <laughs> no. Okay. So Craig, I, I, I wrote this book in part for people like you. Mm-hmm. I want people who, who have no firsthand memory of this, who, who are interested in politics, but, uh, you know, don't didn't live through it and don't remember it. I'd love them to pluck this book off a shelf, uh, be it at a public library or go out and buy it and and learn for yourself about what that time was like. Um, it was a very different time. Mm-hmm. And when you think about the kind of toxicity in politics today, yeah, sure, they had their elbows up and they had plenty of, you know, <laughs> barroom brawls back <laughs> in the day. But John Turner and Brian Mulroney had an underlying civility and friendship. Remember, the two of them were both lawyers in Montreal going back to the 1950s. They knew each other well. They were friends. Brian Mulroney spoke to me for this book. He gave me a, a, a really lovely interview about how extraordinary John Turner was, even though he never won. He was an extraordinary Canadian. And so, yeah, I hope this book goes some distance to, uh, to making people think twice about him, particularly for younger people like you.